Okay? The degree of difficulty goes up here. And only really because of notation. The, the subscripts, the notation, all that stuff sort of starts to uh, multiply um, quite a bit. And it can be rather confusing. But again, it's a return to two-dimensional vectors. Okay, just with sort of an advanced notation type thing. Okay, so we will work on that. But some of the first stuff is actually relatively easy. So it's kind of balanced. Um, there is one sort of one of those mega questions, just like the projectile off the cliff kind of thing, that you will find that I guarantee will be on the test. So we'll get to that. So you will derive the impulse momentum equation from the second law, which we'll do today. You will determine the impulse in the area under force versus time graph. Super easy. Including both positive and negative force and uniform changing force. Super easy there. Experiment to illustrate the law of conservation of momentum in one or two dimensions. For sure, we will do one dimension. The two dimensional one is rather challenging. It takes a fair bit of time, and I'm never really sure that it's worth the effort. So I might skip that again. Solve problems using the impulse momentum equation of the law of conservation of momentum. These are the problem types that you're going to encounter. Calculating momentum using P equals M times V. Super easy. Impulse momentum, uh, fat math problems. That'll make more sense to you in a bit. 1D collisions, which are both inelastic and elastic, and 1D explosions, so things that go and things that go boom. And 2D collisions and explosions, kaboom. And relate the impulse momentum equation to real life situations, for example, hitting a ball or catching a ball, and some, some traffic kind of stuff. So that's sort of the overall thing. So there's a good mix of theory and um, problem solving as well. Okay, let's jump right in. Is that right? Oh. So, Connor is telling me that this one isn't on your sheet. Okay. I must have printed an older version, maybe. Thanks, Connor. I'll be more know that. It's pretty straightforward. Calculate momentum using P equals M times V. It really couldn't be any easier. Well, I do try to make it a little bit tricky by throwing some weird units at you, but for the most part, it's pretty straightforward. Good? Okay, so let's talk about momentum. After this, you're going to be able to define what momentum is. And calculate momentum given mass and velocity. In other words, solve P equals M times V problems. So before we really begin, tell me, what do you think? What does momentum mean? Something has momentum. How much force is built up? Okay, that's kind of common kind of thing that people would say to begin with. So it's kind of like inertia. Inertia is that property of objects to continue doing what they're doing, right? But uh, things that have inertia, like large, heavy things like filing cabinets, can have inertia just sitting still. Does this filing cabinet have momentum? It doesn't. So what two things do you think make up this magical momentum? I hear acceleration. Force and direction. Force and direction. Hmm, that's actually something else. Mass and velocity is correct. Let's just have a quick look here. This booklet. It's a very good job. Oh, God. He's just yeah. cheated. This handout here is the best explanation of momentum there is. It basically covers the entire unit, and it's written in a much friendlier sort of way than the crazy textbook that I have. Okay. Um, so let's just read this first section here. Have you ever wondered how a karate expert can break a stack of cement bricks with a blow of a bare hand? Or why falling on a wooden floor hurts less than falling on a cement floor. Or why follow through is important in golf, baseball, and boxing. To understand these things, you need to recall the concept of inertia introduced and developed when we discuss Newton's laws of motion. Inertia was discussed both in terms of objects at rest and objects in motion. In this chapter, we're concerned only with the concept of inertia in motion, which is momentum. And maybe you should highlight that. Momentum is simply inertia in motion. It has to be moving for there to be momentum. Okay, so 7.1 momentum. We know that it's hard to stop a large truck than a small car when both are moving at the same speed. We say the truck has more momentum than the car. 
by momentum we mean inertia and motion, or more specifically, the mass of an object multiplied by its velocity. So in other words, momentum is mass times velocity. Just as Josh aptly pointed out, it's right there. P equals mv. Now, why do you think we use the letter P for momentum? Because M's already taken. Because scientists are dumb, is that what you said? Scientists like to name things. Scientists do like to name things. But M is already taken for mass. So let's just use the next letter, right? Right? <laughs> N would be the next letter after M. Remember the alphabet? N is used for? Uh, Take. That's the periodic table. N would be newtons, right? Which is in a symbol, but it's a, a unit. So let's try O. Now it looks too much like zero, so let's use P. And that's about the best explanation I can come up, up with why momentum is P. I really don't know. I looked it up a few times. I've only ever discovered there was some kind of Latin thing, and it was kind of, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe not. Anyways, the letter P stands for momentum. Okay? And it is mass times velocity. We can see from the definition that a moving object can have a large momentum if it has a large mass, a high speed, or both. A moving truck has more momentum than a car moving at the same speed because the truck has more mass. But a fast car can have more momentum than a slow truck. And a truck at rest has no momentum at all. Okay, now if you look really, really tiny at that extremely tiny print that I can't read, Barely, a truck rolling down a hill has more momentum than a roller skate with the same speed because the truck has more mass. But if the truck is at rest and the roller skate moves, then the truck has more momentum because only it has speed. So when could they have the same momentum? That's the question on the left there. Where were the when how when would the roller skate and the truck have the same momentum? What would have to happen? The roller skate would have to be moving. Really fast, exactly. Okay, now if you're wanting to sort of follow along in the textbook, it's on page 277, but it's kind of stupid. Momentum is defined as an object's mass times velocity. If you want to write that down, you can. If you want to just highlight it, if you want to just know it, that's okay. It's pretty straightforward. It's one of those straightforward multiply kind of formulas. And since velocity is a vector, and I'm going to officially put the vector symbol above velocity, since it's a velocity, is mass of, uh, since velocity is a vector, is mass a vector? No. no, but because velocity has a direction, that means that momentum is also a vector. When you first were introduced to vectors, I gave you the big four. Force, displacement, velocity, acceleration, momentum, another one. It is a vector, which means you can add momentum vectors. Pause for cheering. And as I expected, there was none. Okay, so in the textbook, there's a really stupid example where there's a sumo wrestler. I think he's like kind of like the cartoons where his feet are really so fast they just become circular. Although I've never seen a sumo move at that speed. Yeah. So it says calculate the momentum of a one kilogram duck. Moving at 28 meters per second, which is pretty darn fast, and of a sumo wrestler with a mass of 200 kilograms moving at 0.5 kilometers an hour, as shown. You wouldn't think so, no. Okay, so I'm just going to move these over here. So, shall we do this example? Yeah. Do you want to jot the question down? Sure. I don't think you have it anywhere on a piece of paper. You jot it down. I got. Okay, so. All we're doing here is we're finding momentum. We've got a one kilogram duck moving at 28 meters per second. Now, the unit for momentum is, if we could just go back here, and I do apologize for this. I should adjust this note a little bit here. The unit for mass is the kilogram. The unit for velocity is the meter per second. And guess what? The unit for momentum is kilogram meters per second. It's rather awkward. You'd think that of all the scientists, they could have come up with someone to name the unit of momentum after. It's a fairly important quantity. But anyways, the unit for momentum is the kilogram meter per second. Okay, so having said that, our one kilogram duck moving at 28 meters per second, so I'm going to write, and I'm going to start getting you used to these um, subscripts, so I'm going to say PD, which stands for duck. momentum duck. 
Okay, so the momentum of the duck, and I'm, again, I'm going to make things a little more complicated, but I'm knowing what's coming down the line. Momentum duck is going to be mass of duck times velocity duck. So PD is MD times VD. Everybody good with that? So in this case, it's going to be 1 kilogram times 28, and his momentum, 28 kilogram meters per second. Okay? Sumo, momentum sumo, PS. <laughs> Mass sumo, velocity sumo. It's important that you get used to this because the situations are going to get bigger and bigger and the way to keep track of everything is to use these subscripts. So I'm just introducing that now. Normally I would not I would just sort of label it doc and then write the formula, right? But Okay, so mass of sumo, 200 kilos. He's moving at 0.5 kilometers an hour. Can I put 0.5 in there? No, I can't. I have to do what? Convert it to meters per second by? Dividing by 3.6. Can I do it all in one step? Math geniuses. Yes, I can. I can put 0.5 divided by 3.6. Can I do it like that? Now, I don't have my calculator handy, so I was going to say Shaden's going to do it for us, but Shaden's going to add it to me. I'm having difficult Shaden. I get 27.8, which is, for all intents and purposes, Kilogram meters per second, the same. And the point here is for you to realize that big, heavy objects like sumo wrestlers and little tiny ducks can have the same momentum if a little tiny object is moving really, really fast. Like 28 meters per second is almost 100 kilometers an hour. That duck is cooking. <laughs> Roast duck, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now normally, in a regular situation, I would have made it gone through the test a little bit, and I would have given, given you this, and then I would say, okay, there's a couple questions on page 278 that you should do, and then I would say there's a car crash video that I would fill the rest of the class with. But given the situation of people being away and stuff, I'm going to keep going on, okay? There might be time, remind me, to show that video at some point. It's somewhere here. It's right here. Maybe we'll save it for a day when I'm not around. Okay? So any questions about any of that? Basically, we just covered this one, right? It's pretty straightforward. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so you can consider these notes again, um, although there's not a whole lot that's sort of super important. One of my favorite little demonstrations I'm going to show you today, although I'm always I'm missing a part. Someone stole a little pipe of mine that I use. It sort of makes it less dramatic, but we'll carry on here. Pardon me? Yeah. If we find, if, if the moment's right, Martin, the moment's right, I know, it's been a couple of years since, I know, I understand your disappointment. You should have been able to, like, I know. I know, we lost that day with the... Uh, Assembly, so maybe we'll just go out and fire it off, right? We won't do calculations. Okay, so we're going to derive the impulse momentum equation from the second law. We're going to relate the impulse momentum equation to real life situations, and we're going to solve problems using the impulse momentum equation. That's three outcomes we're going to cover in the next 20 minutes. What does it have to do with golf? Well, let me tell you this. So, first of all, and here's where I would review from what I just said five minutes ago, which would normally be the day before. A car and a train are traveling at the same speed, it would require more force to stop the train than the car. How come? Because the train is more yeah. massive, way more mass to a train. A bullet fired from a gun penetrates a wood block more than a bullet of identical mass thrown by hand. Right? If I take a bullet and I throw it at you, it ain't going to send you to the hospital. It might hurt, but it will not send you to the hospital. Okay? It's because it's going so fast. 
Okay. Here's where you want to write something down. Maybe not this first part, but certainly the second. These two cases are a result of momentum. Momentum is the product of the mass of a moving body and its velocity. And you already know P equals mv. So here we're going to do another formula derivation. Remember doing those in the kinematics? Okay, here's another formula derivation. Remember this old friend? A equals delta V over delta T from grade 11, maybe even grade 10, some of you. Acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time. And of course, you all remember Newton's second law that says F equals MA. And is that A the same as this A? They're different fonts, and one's got a bar over top of it, but they are basically the same. So that A, with its delta V over delta T, can replace. In other words, this blue bit here can go in for that one. And what do you end up with? F equals M delta V over delta T. Okay? Force is equal to mass times change in velocity we're changing time. F equals MA. It's just another way of rewriting it. Okay? Commonly written another way. So we could write this as when you take M times delta V over delta T, order of operation says you can do the multiplying part first, so you can really go M delta V over delta T, right? You could do it that way. And then what we normally do is we put the delta T up here. Okay? And you end up with this one here. F delta T is equal to M delta V. And that, my friends, is known as the impulse momentum equation. I like to call it fat nav. Because the deltas kind of look like A's. So you got... F delta T or fat equals M delta V or math. I think I'm the only person in the world that calls them that, except for my, my students. So if you go out in the world and someone's talking about fat math, you'll know that they were taught by me. I'm sure it'll never come up in conversation, but if it happens to, you'll probably say, oh, hey, you must have been taught by Mr. Vance. Why does sound famous? That's... I don't know. Well, maybe. <laughs> maybe. F delta T is equal to M delta V. This is known as the impulse momentum equation. Now, momentum we know is MV, so this F delta T thing must be known as impulse. Okay? The product of a force and the time interval during which it acts is called the impulse. That's an important concept. The product of a force and the time interval. In other words, F times T. It's called the impulse. It can also be referred to as a change in momentum. Right? Okay, so here I've got M delta V. We know that, and I'll just put this on the side here, P equals MV, right? Mass times velocity. But if you say M times delta V, change in velocity, well, then that is the change in momentum. Okay? So this change in momentum, this delta P, M delta V, is also known as the impulse. So the impulse, the force multiplied by the time, is what causes a change in momentum. The impulse causes a change in momentum. And this has, has consequences in real life, which I will demonstrate right away. Okay? So impulse is change in momentum. And I'm just going to look ahead here to see what's coming up. I always sort of mess this one up here. Yeah. So this has, like I said, this has some everyday sort of application. Since the change in momentum depends on the force of the time the force acts, this has some use in sports. You've all probably played some sport where they told you follow through, right? Softball, right? They kind of fall through your swing bed. How come? That's a, a lot of coaches don't know the reason. I was going to say, that's what they tell us. Yeah, that's what they tell you. When you're golfing, I'm sure Sean's been taught to follow through, right? What happens if you don't, Sean? 
Well, that's no very far, is it, right? Same thing with a hockey, with a slap shot, you can fall through right under, right? How come? Basically, it's to make it go faster. When you follow through, you are increasing. Let's just let me just see here. What's on my next one? Yeah, okay, it's nothing. So I got to do it manually. The reason for this is in F delta T. Oh, hang on, I'm going to do this this way. I'll do it. F delta T equals M delta V. Okay, so watch. So if you increase, if you follow through. Then what you do is you increase the amount of time. You increase the amount of time that the force is applied. And so you, if you increase the left-hand side, just like a negotiation, like a treaty kind of thing, right? If you increase time, then you have to increase something on the other side. That equal sign should be in the equals there, right? Should have had it as a different color, not blue. Let me do it like this. I'm losing momentum here. If you increase the time on the left-hand side, can you increase the mass of the object? No. You cannot. So the only possible thing to increase is the velocity. To make both sides happy, to increase one side, you must increase the other. So when you follow through, it's to increase the amount of time so that the change of velocity is greater. And if the change of velocity is greater, the ball, the puck, whatever it is, is going to go farther. Allow me to demonstrate in a dramatic way. Okay, so that was fun. Now, the same thing is true for crumple zones in cars. That's what the video shows. Why do they have that crumple zone in the front of your car? When you run your car into a wall, right, and, and the car crumples, what's it doing? It's increasing. Let me just go back to this here, right? I'll go back to regular size. Here's the equation. The mass of the car isn't changing, right? If the car's doing, say, 50 kilometers an hour and you're running the wall, what's the change in velocity? Yeah. Minus 50. It doesn't matter what you say. The change in velocity has to be from 50 to 0. Has to be minus 50. So in other words, you can't change anything on this side of the equation. So the crumple zone increases the amount of time so the only way to make the whole thing bo equal, both sides giving up the same thing, deal, treaty, whatever you want to call it, right? If delta T gets bigger, what has to get smaller? The force has to get smaller. And if the force gets smaller, then what? It doesn't hurt as much. Okay. If I fire, can I get a tennis ball? If I fire this foam ball at Josh's head, right? And if he goes to catch it, Bailey, he plays the fastball, right? When you, when you feel the ball, what are you supposed to do? Now we're actually supposed to kind of do this. Why do you do that? Why do you bring the ball in your body? Awesome, you've got a few footballs in your life. When you catch the ball, you bring it in, right? How come? What you, you don't, you don't know why, but you what, you, yeah, what you're doing is you're increasing the amount of time that the ball's in contact. And therefore, decrease the amount of force so it doesn't hurt as much and more likely to hang on. That's why you do it. Okay? Same thing in the car, the uh, couple zone, you increase the amount of time, which decreases the amount of force, which means there's less damage to the occupant. Okay? So the impulse change, fat equals nav equation, is pretty important. Do you have these sample questions in that package? Everything? Yes, you do. Excellent. Oh okay. yeah. So these are pretty simple. Make sure you get these questions on the test. These are the giveaway marks. These are the simple ones. What force will give a one kilogram mass a velocity of four meters per second in three seconds? Fat equals mass. F delta T is equal to M delta V. Everybody has these questions, right? No one's writing down the questions. What force? We're solving for F. What's the time? Three seconds. What's the mass? One kilogram. What's the change in the velocity? Well, it doesn't say, but it's kind of implied that the initial velocity is 
zero. And if it's going from zero to four, then that means the delta V is simply four. And I think we're all bright enough to just put a four in there and understand what's going on. So this is pretty easy stuff. It's just going to be one times four divided by three, which of course is four thirds or 1.3 newtons. Do not expect 31 marks of those questions. Expect one. Maybe multiple choice. Yeah. Although multiple choice is just as easy to mark as long answer when it comes to that, right? Pretty straightforward. Okay, let's make it a bit harder here. A 10 newton force acts on a 2 kilogram mass for 5 seconds. Find the impulse, find the delta P, find the final velocity of the object. What is the impulse? Now, I haven't told you this yet, but the, the letter that stands for impulse, want to guess? You'd think so, but it's not. He really likes to see how. Yeah, it's actually J is impulse. I can't explain, Martin. I, I is electric current. Yeah, J, because it's the next letter, right? Oh, yeah, it is the next letter. J is equal to, now the impulse is just the fat part of the equation, F delta T. So that's going to be 10 newtons, 5 seconds. Now, I haven't told you this yet either, but what is the unit for impulse? Well, it's, well, let's do the, it's 10 times 5 or 50. Uh, not per second, it's because it's force multiplied by time, it's 50 newton seconds. 50 newton seconds of impulse. Yeah, things get a little weird in this unit. Find the delta P. Okay, well, delta P is mass times velocity, but I only have the mass. How am I going to do this? Well, you will remember F delta T is equal to M delta P. These two things are, in fact, equal. This 50 newton seconds is equivalent to 50 in momentum terms, 50 kilogram meters per second. They are one and the same quantity. A newton second is a kilogram meter per second. I know, kind of confusing. So we're going to put that 50, in other words, put that 50 up there. And I'm going to write 50 is equal to. No, just go away. 50 is equal to the mass, 2, change in velocity. So the change in the velocity is simply 50 divided by 2, 25 meters per second. Is that okay? Everyone's good? And if the change in velocity is 25, then that means in part C that the final velocity, if the initial is zero, then the final is also 25 meters per second. Fat math questions are relatively simple. Why don't you sort of done it? Is there another sample there to do? Yeah. Just one? Yeah. Do you want to try this one on your own? You guys give that one a roll. I think I probably gave you lots of space in case you make a mistake. Give that one a try, and then I'll show you the answer. I think so. How much time will it take to slow a 5 kilogram body moving at 10 meters per second to 5 meters per second if a breaking force of 10 newtons is applied? So did you realize that you have to find the change in velocity first? Vf minus Vi, so that's going to be 5 minus 20 or minus 15. And if you want to do that all inside the, the big formula, you can do that too. F delta T is equal to M delta V. How much time? We've got 10 newtons. We're solving for time. The mass is 5. Our change in velocity is minus 15. So our time is simply 5 times minus 15 all over. Now, hmm, this is going to give me a negative time, is it not? 5 times 15, 4 times 15 is 30, 60. Minus 75 over 10 is going to be minus 7.5 seconds. Did you get that number? Yeah. Okay, but what do, what do we do with this negative? Just erase it. Just ignore it. Kind of like a test coming up. Just ignore it. 
Exactly. It's a breaking force, so the force itself is actually negative, which makes negative over negative, so you can't have negative time. Okay? All right. You got a few minutes. I don't think I'm going to try to do any else. So you've got, what I would suggest you do is, if you're still unsure of some of this stuff, you can read section 7.2, impulse change and momentum. You can read about that. They show some nice stuff about cars hitting walls and boxes getting hit in the face with punches. Cars hitting haystacks and so on. Hey, so I'm you to remind me about that video. Which one? Car crash. Oh, it won't be Oh, oh, no, it's like it's like 18 as long. Well. A cool if you ever if you ever want to look something up, this is a cool thing called the Pelton water wheel. Um, a water wheel is way more efficient because the water actually bounced. It's kind of an interesting application of that. You can see it on the next page. Um, I would suggest you do a few of these as some practice. Although most people realize it's pretty straightforward. Um, skip right ahead, find the tough ones tomorrow. We will look at force versus time graphs. It's pretty straightforward. And I will also do 1D collisions tomorrow as well. Okay? And then I will give Thursday's period of work. Today's period of work. Sound good? No school Friday. <laughs> yeah, that's right.